Okay. There we go. Now we're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, another night session of everything you want to know about oysters, but were, was afraid to ask. We're afraid to ask. Uh, you know the Woody Allen one about oysters and aphrodisiacs. It's not true what they say about oysters and aphrodisiacs. I ate six the other day and only three worked. No, that's not how it goes. Anyway, we're going to talk today about, uh, I was just talking with Dr. Reisman about oysters and all the nice little fouling organisms and things that happen. And so many questions that get asked about, about these things. And so one day I kind of made a, uh, a video to, to help people Let me move all this stuff out of my way so I can see, there we go. Help people uh, identify what's going on with their oysters and, and kind of address a bunch of the questions that come up about oysters and, uh, and, and the like. So I hope everybody's got their oysters. If you haven't gotten your oysters yet, there's still oysters available. Um, come by and see me. Or drop me an email and we'll get your seed going. Um, and here we go. So, you know, oysters are, are an interesting animal. They're an invertebrate that is uh, somewhat uh, fragile in certain respects and very hardy in a, in a lot of other respects. So uh, there are some things that will uh, affect an oyster and we're going to go through a bunch of these. So uh, one thing that has been asked a lot is about the different water quality parameters that can affect an oyster. Uh, I just was asked by my intern, uh, Maggie, uh, do you sample the water and, and do the water quality an analysis on the water? And, you know, in the past, I've been at Cornell for 26 years and for 26 years, basically it didn't seem like the water parameters changed a whole lot, but I'll tell you something in the last couple of years, uh, I would venture to say that water quality parameters are changing. S uh, some of them being, you know, the water temperature. Uh, we should absolutely be monitoring our water temperature to get a, a, a kind of a baseline of what's going on because boy, I, it, it sure seems as though the water is awfully warm early on in the season. Uh, water temperatures, do they affect oysters? Well, uh, I would say that our oysters do not like it really, really hot. And when I'm saying really hot, 80 degree water in the bay is very hot. That's hot water. Uh, the oysters up in Maine and the oysters north of us uh, are much cooler. And, you know, they, they uh, the, if you look at oysters down south, it gets very warm. There are a host of problems that happen with never having cool water. So oysters can handle warm temperatures. It's not like they're, they're going to reach a uh, they probably would reach a critical uh, temperature after 90 degrees. I mean, I, I don't think our water has ever gotten 90 degrees, but it got 80 last year. Uh, so oysters actually do very well in the winter. A lot of people that uh, overwintered their oysters were surprised at how well they did. Well, oysters aren't affected by cold, cold water unless even freezing, they have a they have a antifreeze glycoprotein in their blood that keeps them from freezing solid. So they can actually handle cold water uh, quite well. So uh, and the thing with oysters and a lot of shellfish is they gauge their reproduction on the temperature changes in the season. They actually will. In, this, in the winter when they've come out of hibernation, they are going to uh, wake up in the, in the winter in hibernation. They're just putting on maintenance survival. There's not a lot of algae in the water, if any. 
uh, the water temperature is cold, possibly even close to freezing. And so they're just putting energy into their vital functions of the heart, the kidney, and staying alive. And when they wake up in, in the spring, and I would say it's really quite early in the spring, uh, well before we want to get out into the water in early March, uh, especially oysters are coming alive. They're eating a cold water algae that comes up first. It's, it's usually a diatom like Ketoceris locally. Then they'll start feeding on that in March. And between March and in, let's say June, as the temperature is rising and rising, they're putting on reproductive growth. And when you get those first couple really warm spikes of warm weather, that will induce spawning. And so temperature plays a very important role for uh, the, the life cycle of the oyster. Now, temperature is also going to play an interesting role in their food source in algae. So uh, what's going to happen, I, I, I sense it's going to happen this year at the Marine Center. It didn't really happen last year. But what happens in August is the macro algaes are really going to start taking off and they're gonna use the nutrients uh, that are available. And the microalgaes that our shellfish wanna eat okay. might get down to a, a low level. People happen to notice, they'll come by in August and notice how clear the water looks. And that's because the microalgaes are, are starting to take a little bit of a dive because the macros are using the- uh, Put my name there. The, uh, who, oh, are, are using the nutrients up. So. Temperature plays a role in, in oysters that way. Salinity, you know, salinity shouldn't vary that much. It really is going to depend on rainfall or drought that it will, will change the salinity of any particular uh, embayment. And you might live on a bay that has fresh water coming in, fresh water either from underground fresh water or from runoff from a, from a river or whatnot. And so your salinity might be... Uh, different. O open ocean is about 35 parts per thousand and parts per thousand is just a, a, a fraction. It's, it's 3.5 percent or 35 parts per thousand. Our salinity uh, in the bays is hovering around 28 parts. Pretty salty. So we've got nice salty oysters and they like that. Uh, the one that is really critical, however, is oxygen and oxygen levels, uh, in the summertime, oxygen levels can get quite low because the sun is baking on the water. The sun can bake out the oxygen. You, this is where in the summertime, you might get some fish kills from a lot of uh, menhaden or bunker coming in and a lot of activity. They need a lot of oxygen. And, and in, in big masses when the, in the summer, when they're in feeding frenzies and whatnot, you, you see fish kills. Um, oysters and, and shellfish in our shallow, very warm uh, creeks and, and, and uh, coves and whatnot can be affected by, by oxygen levels. And so that's one that would be uh, important to monitor. Uh, if, you get a, if you get a dip of less than three parts per million oxygen, you, you can get mortality in your shellfish. So uh, in the past, we've had the equipment to, to uh, monitor. If people are interested in monitoring, we can bring that program back uh, to that. Now, most of this talk is actually going to be about predators, uh, some diseases, in oysters, uh, harmful algal blooms, uh, competitors, you know, competitors, uh, we, could, we could call those, um, you know, fouling organisms. Uh, and so we're gonna look at, at, at these things a little bit more closely. Okay. Ah, a gallery of rogues. I, there are a couple of SPAT members that kind of remind me of that guy there. I won't name any names. Uh, Anyone know what that thing is on the screen? <laughs> it's actually an oyster toadfish. 
And it's called an oyster toadfish, not because it eats oysters. It actually doesn't eat oysters. It, it lives within oyster reefs and whatnot. It's, it's a very common fish. You might find the, find the, uh, the toadfish in, in your gear if you don't tend it like I don't tend mine. Uh, I find toadfish all the time. They actually will eat some of the predators that eat the oysters like crabs and whatnot, but sure looks like a rogue. But this guy here, if, if you haven't seen a mud crab, uh, then you, I don't know where you live. These things are, are just ubiquitous and very plentiful. Uh, just today I did a program on Dune Road and, and the leader of the pack said, what's the number one predator of oysters? And, and her answer was humans. Well, I certainly wouldn't have said humans uh, because I, it depends on how you're looking at it. If you're looking at nature, humans are not the main predator of oysters. Uh, in our creeks, mud crabs or, you know, the whole gallery of crabs are certainly major, major predators and cause huge amounts of, of uh, damage to the oyster stocks. It doesn't matter what size oyster you have, there's always seems to be a crab that can do your oyster in. And that's why we, you know, maintain gear. Can, can that crab get in, in the mesh that it's sitting on? And the answer is sure it can because crabs start off as a larvae. And so if you didn't tend your oysters for a year, you could find a, a, a mud crab that's lived its entire life inside of your cage uh, that got in when it was really quite small. So there's the mud crab and, and you know, they have quite, quite sizable enough claws to eat small seed like popcorn. So that uh, a predator not to be uh, uh, taken lightly. Uh, spider crabs, you know, if you see a big spider crab in your cage, boy, you haven't been around your oyster cage for years. I've never seen, you know, I've seen little decorator crabs that look like spider crabs inside of, inside of some of the nets, but never the big uh, labinia that, that uh, can get really large. I mean, they're pretty close to our, uh, an equivalent of our Alaskan king, king crab. And I've seen, uh, I've seen these spider crabs on the bottom of Peconic Bay, kind of in the winter where they were burrowed into the mud, just paving the, the bottom of the bay. And one oyster grower that put all of the seed on the bottom and wondered where it was. I'm sure these, the, the, the spider crabs on his grounds ate pretty much every oyster seed that he threw down there. So they, they can be a predator. We get lady crabs uh, or the calico. Uh, they're a swimming crab. They've got the little swimmerettes on the back there. And, uh, and they kind of like a blue claw crab, uh, a little smaller. I don't know if, I've never eaten one. I don't know if they're as yummy as a blue claw, but uh, they're very similar. And they can be a voracious predator, uh, especially of small, smaller oysters. And our, our blue claw crab, blue claws are coming around. I don't know if we're gonna have a great season, but I'm starting to see them. Um, last year, I only had a couple really big meals of blue claws and uh, they're wonderful eating predator. So all is fair in love and war with blue claws. But I'll tell you something, those things, I used to give, get prepared for giving out seed bags by putting them in the little mesh bags and, and be ready for people to come and get their seed. And one year, I just hung like 10 seed bags off the dock for on a Friday. When I came back on Monday, there wasn't one oyster left. The, the blue claws just went right through the bag, ate everything, just shrapnel. So, uh, you know, you, you, you can't leave food out. It's, it's like, leave, they're like little bears. You can't leave food out because they're gonna come and sniffing around. And once they find your stuff, they're gonna eat you out of house and home. So the only thing I can tell you is get even with them. You know, if they're gonna eat your oyster, you might as well go out and eat the blue claw. They're really good. 
maybe one day I'll have we'll we'll give a demonstration on how how to prep a blue claw for cooking. I have a great thing that I learned that keeps keeps the plate nice and clean and 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 makes eating a blue claw a little more pleasurable. Asian shore crab. We have a couple. We have a couple evasive species of of crab, and the Asian shore crab is one of them. And uh, they have little bandy legs. You, they're very recognizable by their like candy cane-ish type bandy legs that they've got. This picture is not really showing the the banded legs, but Asian shore crab came in clearly from Asia and and started taking over. Uh, certain crab populations. So that, that's pretty plentiful. We have it at the Marine Center, especially out at the inlet. Uh, you can turn over any rock and find an Asian shore crab. So they're, they're, they are there for sure. And, and the green crab, another one that's an evasive that is uh, in some areas is really uh, under the Pontiquag Bridge is paved with green crabs. And uh, you know, they, they, they they want to eat. They're, crabs in general, by the way, are considered to be opportunistic feeders. And the way I look at a crab is it'll eat everything. It'll eat itself if it's hungry. <laughs> you know, it's like a crab will eat anything that it can eat. It, it'll start with the choice things. If, if you're offering up oysters, uh, they'll eat that. If 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 there's dead fish, they'll eat that. If they if they can get a live fish, run after a live fish, they'll get that. Uh, if they some will eat detritus, uh, which is some broken down plant materials. And so you know they're opportunistic feeders, but given the choice, th they'll be pretty carnivorous. Now. Uh, this little guy here, definitely don't underestimate it. These snails aren't very big. Oh. You know, they're, they're maybe a half inch, three, could get three quarters of an inch. These are voracious predators of oysters and other shellfish. If you've ever walked on the beach and picked up a shell that has a single hole that looks like a Dremel tool drilled into it. That's the oyster drill damage. And what they do is they rasp a hole. They have a, a, an organ called the radula, which is like a rasp. And it'll rasp a, a, a perfect hole it, through the shell, inject its digestive fluids into the into the organism and liquefy it and then eat it that way. And if you have an infestation of oyster, I've seen an oyster company that had an infestation of oyster drills and it just, you know, it, it, it was wiping them out for sure. Now, if you find oyster drills in your cages, you know, uh, you don't have to be well, if you're a Buddhist, you're probably going to throw it back in the water. If you're with your grandkids, you might throw it back in the water, but you really shouldn't put them back in the water. Did you know New York state law, if you're a Bay person and you're all, by the way, Bay people, because you're all growing oysters, you're actually, if you pull a predator out of the water, you're not supposed to put it back in the water. This was a law that was enacted in New York back in the 1900, early 1900, because there, there was a lot of predation and we're gonna to get to one of the culprits that kind of made that law go into effect. And so the, the, you, you weren't supposed to just shove it overboard again. You had to take it out of the water and leave it on your neighbor's driveway or something like that, or at the dump. I'm not sure what they used to do with them, uh, but not put them back in the water. These ones, the knob whelk and the channel whelk, are voracious predators of shellfish. And they, uh, they'll do a, the similar thing that the oyster drill will, will do. The interesting thing about the knob whelk and the channeled whelk is it's like the biggest fishery in the Peconics. These things are, whenever you see a buoy on Peconic Bay, it's not a lobster trap, it's a winkle trap. It's, it's, it's for catching whelks.
Uh, all those are whelk traps. It's a multi-million dollar fishery for selling like skungil. That's the, that's what, what it is. And unfortunately, a, a byproduct of this, the bait for the winkle trap is pretty much horseshoe crab. I was clamming today right at the Marine Center and I got a horseshoe crab. And I was surprised because I haven't seen, I mean, horseshoe crabs have really diminished in number. Uh, there's a study that Cornell's doing up and, you know, looking at horseshoe crabs at a spot where uh, Tyana, we have a bunch of growers at Tyana and they're doing studies of the, of the horseshoe crabs. And right off the bay, every Tuesday, you'll see the guy in his boat mopping for horseshoe crabs for his winkle trap bag. So it's, it's pretty trick. It, it, it's, it's a tricky dance because these things are so ancient, the horseshoe crab, and you, you don't see them in the kind of numbers that you used to see. And uh, one of the reasons might be just, you know, baiting these, these traps could be other things too. I'm not going to blame the winklers for that, but it would be nice to think of a different bait for them. Now this guy, the common sea star, and this is a picture of it actually eating an oyster. And if you don't know how a sea star eats an oyster, you must learn it because uh, it's, it's a story to tell at Thanksgiving uh, when your little grandkids are around or your kids are around. Uh, what happens with a sea star is it will wrap around the oyster like this one is doing and it's got suction cups on its legs and it'll just apply pressure outward. It'll clamp onto this thing, top shell, bottom shell, and just apply pressure. So when the shellfish opens its shell, the stomach of the sea star comes out its mouth and slips between the two shells and digests inside the, inside the oyster like that. And uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty remarkable that, that a sea star can eat an, a, a clam, an oyster, these things. And back in the 1900s, this was the number one predator in Peconic Bay. And so <laughs> you can just picture, it was such a, it's such a cool creature. Uh, the sea star for for a number of reasons. It's a it, it it's it's got it's the only phylum that has what's called radial symmetry. So it's it, it it's got round symmetry. So the thing with the sea star is it's got a central ring. It's radial symmetry. It's got a central ring around its five arms, and if you cut that thing into like a pizza into eight pieces, you'll get eight new sea stars as long as you have a piece of the central ring. So you can imagine an angry Bayman in the 1900s with his machete hacking apart a sea star and throwing it overboard because he's so pissed off that he just ate, ate a bunch of his oysters. And, and instead of getting rid of one sea star, you just made eight new ones. Uh, thus the reason for not being allowed to put them back in the water, uh, especially if you have a, a penchant for hacking your predators to pieces. Uh, if, you cut, if you cut an arm off of a sea star, it'll grow a new arm, but the arm will not grow a new sea star. It has to have a piece of the central ring. Now, they did such an effective job of getting rid of these sea stars that it's very hard to find one in the Peconic Bay. So I, I've I, I can't really recall ever finding a, a, a the common sea star. I find them. I used to find them under the Ponacoag Bridge. Apparently, a couple of years ago, there was a sea star blight, and it was knocking back the numbers of sea stars, um, even more so where they where they you could find them. And they're they're for us. They're important to find some because we teach the kids about you know marine life, and it, sea stars are definitely a an excellent species to look at. We do have brittle stars. If you've ever gone in the eelgrass or you've, you know, up in Orient and a lot of places, you'll find that the brittle stars, which are really quite beautiful, uh, little very spindly armed uh, uh, neighbor. 
There's my favorite predator. I, I saw one of these at Albertson Marine when I was bringing my boat in a couple of weeks ago with my son, the American oyster catcher. These are also on, on Dune Road and whatnot. If you've ever seen the oyster catcher and it eats oysters. I mean, it's got to, it gets its name from eating oysters. Uh, beautiful predator. If you have this one, just name your predator and, and love your predator. This is a this is one that you got to feed a couple oysters to just to keep it in your in your backyard because that's a beautiful that's a beautiful bird the oyster catcher. I suppose if you had a flock of them and they were eating you out of house and home, you'd get kind of mad at them. But I've never seen a lot of them just chowing down on oysters uh, and wreaking havoc. So there's some of the some of the predators. Let's talk about some of the fouling organisms. Now, a fouling organism, one of the distinctions of a fouling organism versus a, a predator is the fouling organism isn't interested in your oysters. Uh, the fouling organism is more interested in the surface area that your cage is providing or, or the oyster itself uh, in, in most cases. So we're gonna look at, at, at this fouling organisms. So the club tunicate, these, if you have these the size of chicken legs and there's a picture, <laughs> this is a picture uh, on the, uh, my right, I guess everyone's right, of, of a cage that that's, was brought up. I got this online. This wasn't one of our cages. This was actually from up north, like around Maine or, or, or Rhode Island or something. And it must have been an abandoned cage because any grower that lets their gear get that foul uh, shouldn't be growing anything. Uh, unless you're growing club tunicates. I mean, they look like chicken legs, but let me tell you something. They don't taste, they don't taste like chicken. <laughs> okay. Uh, they are, you know what? That's a tunicate. And I'm going to tell you an interesting thing about tunicates. Go and look it up in your invertebrate textbook and you're out of luck because tunicates are not invertebrates and they're not in your invertebrate textbook. Uh, and you might say, how, how could that be? You, you mean to tell me that that thing is an animal and it's not even a, an invertebrate? And the answer is, it's a urochordate. We're chordates, I'm a chordate. I've, I have half, a, half of a regular spinal cord and half a metal one. <laughs> so what, am I, what does that make me? A, uh, uh, oh, a, I'm a robo, Chordate, <laughs> that's what I am, uh, and proud of it. Uh, and these are urochordates because in their in their life cycle, uh, they have a, a notochord, a rudimentary notochord. So that puts them in the uh, phylum or sub not phylum. I don't, is that phylum? It's, it's not a phylum. It's a, it's, it's a subphylum or a uh, class. I'd have to look that up. Can you fill up phylum? Class Eurocordata. So all tunicates. And we're going to look at a couple tunicates. So keep that in mind, just as another tidbit at your raw bar or whatnot, that when you're looking at these weird things, it's, it's kind of fascinating to think that they are effectively higher up on the evolutionary scale of things than the oyster is because they're not invertebrates. And uh, what are they? They're an animal that, that just is filtering water uh, and eating microalgae like the oyster. So in that way, it's competing. And, uh, and it, what it's really doing is using, you know, using the surface area and this cage to the right that the guy pulled up must have weighed hundreds of pounds of fouling organisms. So uh, I've, I've seen, I pulled a cage or somebody pulled a cage off of a line. By the way, I know I meander a lot, but if you missed an entire year over at SPAT because of, of COVID-19 and you're saying, oh, well, I'll get back there one day. You know, if you're thinking that your oysters are, are now well underway and they're 
you know, 18 months old and you can go back now that the coast is clear and your oysters are going to be huge. They're probably going to be more like all dead and full of fouling organisms because we certainly didn't tend your stuff for 18 months. And so I, somebody pulled some cages from the back that nobody had been at and they had chicken leg size club tunicates on them. You could tell how old they, they, they were. They kind of look like yeah, Bob Marley, you know, dreadlocks all over the thing. And uh, so that's the club tunicate. And here's a, oh, there's a bunch of pictures that James Wojcik took. We have all the po his postcards. He did that on purpose. He let gear get foul so he could take pictures of them. And so you can see how bad, uh, and actually the one that somebody pulled off of the line uh, on Wednesday, it was pretty close to looking that bad. And, and these big club tunicates all over it. There's a whole bunch of other things. That's a sponge, there's a red beard sponge, there's a sulfur sponge. There's some other things that we're gonna look at in that fouling, but that's, that's what he's, that is there. This one is pretty ubiquitous. You, I'm sure a lot of you have this on your oysters. I call it, I call it marine tool dip because it's like the tool dip if you ever, for you tool dip people out there that dip your tools in tool dip. It makes a little rubbery coating on your tools. I actually have never done that. I'm gonna get some tool dip and dip some tools just so I can say I'm a tool dip kind of person. But I certainly have oysters that have marine tool dip, which is a colonial tunicate asteroides. You can see the little star shape. They're quite beautiful. And each one is an animal, 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 animal. And they make this, you can almost peel it off like silly putty. You remember silly putty? You, you can peel it off and it'll, uh, when you peel it off of an oyster or a scallop, you'll see all the embossed crenulations on it. And it's kind of cool. And it doesn't hurt the oyster. I almost think that it helps the oyster. It, it like rubberizes the oyster a little bit, but you guys are getting so into the pressure washer and the, and the, and the, oyster washing machine that I tell you, you're not getting any of this stuff on your oysters. I'm very proud of everybody, uh, how well they're tending their oysters. And, uh, but the, but the gear, oh, well, you really, everyone loves the pressure washer. So you're not seeing back in the day, you'd pull an oyster cage out and you could have it pretty well socked in with this, the, this colonial tunicate. Uh, so another tunicate, and here's uh, some, some fouling of it with the tunica. And you can see if you, if you leave this stuff long enough, it'll completely occlude the mesh. And once you, once you block the mesh for flow, you're not gonna get flow and, and you're, you're not gonna get as much growth in your oysters because you're restricting the flow. Sea grapes or sea squirts, boy, if you haven't seen a sea squirt, you're a lucky, lucky person. Uh, again, it seems like everyone's keeping up really well with everything. Um, but these things ne never seem to not be there. I'm not sure what part of the season of the year that these things aren't around, Mogula. And, you know, when you get <laughs> another, another classic picture of gear that clearly must have, well, you know, I've, I, we've had gear that looks that bad. Uh, so I shouldn't make fun of this guy. Uh, once you get them in there, you, you, you know, they, they grow fast. Again, they're filtering the water. If you've got good algae, they're growing really well. Um, on the bottom of mesh of our floating upweller barrels, we can get them looking almost that bad. If, if, you, if you skip, if you go three weeks without looking at something, it can get that bad. Um, and again, all of these things that you've seen so far are tunicates. Macroalgaes, we've been getting a lot of macroalgaes. People have been keeping up with their macro, macroalgaes. I've been noticing that, uh, you know, this green filamentous uh, algae that's getting in there uh, seems to be imparting on some people's oysters a beautiful green coloration on the shell. I really like that green coloration on the shell. I think it's really classy. Uh, the problem again is just going to be this macroalgae 
occluding the, the, the mesh and restricting the flow. Uh, that's, that's the only, only issue with that. Believe it or not, blue mussels can be a fouling organism. A lot of people ask me, how come you guys don't grow blue mussels? And the truth of the matter is if, well, there's two, a bunch of different truths. One of the truths is that our water in the bay seems to get too hot. So they, they really kind of die off in the heat of the summer. Uh, they, they seem to like it uh, cooler uh, to, to really thrive. Uh, this picture here, I believe, was taken up in uh, Prince Edward Island. And so uh, Prince Edward Island has a, has a huge muscle uh, culture operation. And if you, I, I, I will give a, a presentation on the oysters of France and the maritime provinces where you're going to see blue mussels being a fouling organism where they don't even want them. They want to grow oysters, but they are getting just socked in with mussels and socked in with mussels. This is a mussel sock right here, by the way. You can, you can set an attractant for the mussels and they go, Whoosh. They don't really have hatcheries for blue mussels. Once you get blue mussels in your system, it's very hard to get rid of them. Uh, they're wonderful eating. If, uh, and so, you know, they are a product. But again, if you don't want them, oil derricks down in, 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 the, uh, in the Gulf, uh, the Gulf Coast, uh, this is a major fouling organism. They have to pay to get rid of these. And I'm pretty sure that the people that get rid of these off of the oyster rigs are also selling them. So they're getting kind of a, a, a double, a double there, which is fair. That's fair. Nothing wrong with that. Barnacles, barnacles. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that can get on there uh, when, when you get a barnacle set on your oysters, they're going to look like a lot of people say, oh, look, I've got all this new oyster spat on my oyster shell. And I'll look at it and it's like, oh, no, actually, that's those are barnacles. And if you leave them there, your oyster could end up looking. Here's an oyster. It looks like an oyster set on shell. But the rest of these are barnacles. And uh, you know, if you're commercial operation, that's a problem getting a, a barnacle infestation like that. Uh, if you if you get them off when they're young and, and don't start making a, a, their shell, uh, they're easier to get rid of. You know, I didn't, I, I, I missed something I was going to tell you back when we were on the, um, the oyster drill. If you see on your shell, these little kind of rubbery, feathery looking polyps on your shell. Those are the egg cases of the, uh, of the oyster drill. Uh, if you're not familiar, I wish I had a picture. I, I don't think I have a picture. I'll have to have uh, Darcy send everyone a nice picture of, of uh, egg cases of, of oyster drill because those you kind of don't want to put back in the water or put back in your gear. They look like, they almost look like feathers, but they're rubbery, little rubbery feathers. That's the egg case of the, of the oyster drill. So a lot of these things you're going to get set on your oysters, but the way that people are pressure washing and tending, they never get anywhere because you're, you're getting them off before they can harden up. By the way, a, a barnacle is actually a crustacean. They're related to crabs. Uh, they, they are a crustacean. Slipper limpets are mollusks. They've got a, they're a univalve. When, when somebody, a lot of times, the only time you ever heard of limpet was a limpet mine. And a limpet mine was something that would stick onto like the bottom of hull of a boat and blow the boat up, a limpet mine. The limpets have a, have a, a, a foot like a suction cup foot and, and clamp onto like the oyster here. And they actually will clamp onto themselves. They'll stack and stack and stack. So you might get a stack of seven or eight uh, slipper limpets. And these are pretty plentiful. Oh, these are stacking. I was just starting to stack up on here, but sometimes you'll see the stacks of, 
of uh, adult slipper limpets. Some people eat them. You can eat the, the, the foot of these things. They're not, it's, it takes a, takes a while to get a meal out of them, but you know, you know they actually taste like the, um, the adductor muscle of a clam, it, kind of that sweet little meat in, in the slipper limpet. And again, they don't, they don't hurt the, the, the animal. They're not after the oyster, but it's a fouling organism that you might not want on there. Uh, this is a calcareous tube worm. This is, this is a picture of a really old and kind of destroyed shell. Uh, the, 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 the tube worm didn't do this damage. Tube worm just makes a, a, a calcium tube and lives within. So the worm is red and lives inside of the tube and it looks like spaghetti. I, I kind of like calcareous tube worms when I see them because they're not that bad, but I've seen them that, that makes the thing look like a golf ball of, of tube worms when it's really infested. And then it's a, a, a little bit much. Again, they don't hurt. It's not the same as a mud blister worm that's inside the oyster. And that creates the black shell on the inside and a, uh, kind of you know, a problem, a blister that, that can smell even sulfury when you, if you pop it and that's inside the shell. These are always on the outside and they're, <laughs> they're more ornamental than, than, I mean, that's a really bad picture. I've, I, I had an oyster today that had a calcareous tube worm on it and it looked kind of cool. So uh, the boring sponge it's not a predator. It doesn't want the oyster. What it wants is the calcium of the oyster shell. So it gets inside, it, 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 it lives inside as sponges sporulate. They get these little spores. It gets inside in between the shell of the, uh, of the oyster and starts dissolving the, and using the calcium. So if you've ever walked along the beach and seen a shell, I got a picture coming up with holes and tons of holes in them, that was caused by the boring sponge. And the problem with the, the boring sponge, it makes the shell very brittle. If you've got boring sponge all over your sponge and you're a commercial guy, you won't be able to sell those oysters. If you've got boring sponge and your oysters and it could be making the shell brittle, but I'll tell you something, it, to do that kind of damage, the oyster has to be a bunch of years old. It's not going to do it in a two-year-old oyster. It, do, it doesn't develop well enough to, to, to create a problem in a two-year-old oyster. It, it really takes a bunch of years to get the damage to, to uh, boring sponge. If you want to see boring sponge in action, just come out to Goose Creek with us when we go uncover oysters that we've left abandoned for a bunch of years and I'll show you boring sponge because we definitely, <laughs> it's definitely there. And so it'll, it'll do that to the, you know, if you see a shell like this on the beach uh, and it's not after the oyster, but once it, once it penetrates all the way through the shell to the meat, that oyster is definitely going to die. It's going to die from bacteria and everything else that, is, that's going to be able to infiltrate the, uh, the oyster. Uh, through the through the channels there, or you know, it's amazing how long an oyster can hang on with boring sponge. I've seen, I, I've been able to take a live oyster and just break it into pieces. The oyster's still alive, uh, but the shell is completely uh, shot. <gasps> What's that? Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, okay. We're going to talk about some oyster diseases here. So. Our oyster, Crassostria virginica, which everyone knows, uh, it, it knows that it's the only oyster on the east coast of the United States, and uh, it is victim to a couple different oyster diseases that are uh, unique, let's say, at least the, no, the, the naming of the disease is unique to Crassostria virginica. And I say that because, for instance, MSX. MSX 
it w- was given its name because it is multinucleated spheroid unknown. That was originally because they didn't know what the sphere was, this little red spheres in here when you do a, a when you do a stain uh, section, electron micrograph uh, section of oyster tissue that's been stained, you pick up these spheres. And then they they did key this out to be a protozoan Haplosporidium nelsoni. So now we know that this is MSX in in our eastern oyster. And when I say it's unique, you know, you might have a disease of another species that's given another name. Bonamia is is a disease that just affects European flat oysters. So is that the same as MSX and Crassosia virginica? Probably not, but uh, I bring that up because there was a disease in an oyster that they were fooling around with in the Chesapeake, Crassostria area kensis, that started showing signs of, um, I, I think it was actually Rose, it might've been Rosia barris, which is coming up, but they called it something else because it was a different species. So it's a little confusion. A lot of times the pathologists are battling it out to get a micrograph, to recognize it, to key it out so that they can definitively call it what it is. And uh, I think Otto's still on board this. Is Otto still here? He's still here, Otto? Yep. Well, yes, I'm here. hey, Otto, uh, back in the day, we used to go to all these conferences that this guy, Austin Farley, uh, the, the mm-hmm. kind of Jack Daniel slinging uh, banjo player. And he was trying to figure out what a disease was. And he had a big battle with another. Was it a protozoan? Was it a bacteria? He said it was a protozoan. She said it was a bacteria. And that fight went on for ages because nobody could get a good electron micrograph of the disease and and name it. And that one's coming up in a second, but it, it, it's, it's very interesting. By the way, this would look like a mud blister. MSX is kind of prevalent in the Chesapeake. They've never, once you get MSX in your system, it's hard to get it out. And I tell you, this one really kills oysters. This one has knocked back the Chesapeake oyster industry pretty much on its on on its feet we don't have msx we've had bouts of it close by and maybe even in new york in the past but you know here's a good time for me to do my pedestal speech about if you buy oysters from any fish market or whatever and don't put them back in the in the water if you live on the water and you bought oysters from the Chesapeake. You went for a road trip to the Chesapeake and bought a bushel of oysters because they were cheap and you ate them all the whole way up on your way home and you got home to your waterfront home and you had 24 oysters left. Don't put them in the water because you can put MSX in our water and and we'll have a hard time getting rid of it. And that's how these diseases are spread by by moving shellfish around and putting them into the water. so you can't do that. You got to eat them all up or, or just don't put them in the water. We don't have MSX. Chesapeake still does. It's, hard, it's a hard one to get rid of. And they haven't really done that yet. So this is a disease we definitely don't want. Discovered in 1957. It's pretty new. It's protozoan parasite. A lot of high mortality in the summer months. Uh, it's, and, and here's, this is interesting. It's thought to have been introduced by experimental transfers with the Pacific oyster, gigas. This is why we don't allow people to grow non-indigenous species of oysters uh, it, on the East Coast. Because if you try to grow the gigas, which is grown everywhere else in the world, including California, uh, you, can get, you can get things that, that happen. And, and what's interesting is the transmission of this disease is still unknown. It's pretty much uh, thought that there's a secondary, uh, there's secondary host. And so 
they've never really, you, you can have, take an oyster that has MSX and put it next to an, a, a, a naive oyster and it won't get MSX. So there's an intermediate host that gives the disease and they haven't really come to grips with what that is yet after all this time. Now, dermo is another oyster disease, Perkensis marinus. It's these little black dots. And here's what an oyster with dermo looks like. And what an oyster with dermo looks like is kind of what an oyster that has spawned out looks like in the summer. You can eat an oyster that has dermo. It won't, it, it won't taste as good as your hearty chocolate block oyster, uh, but, but it won't be like, it won't get you sick or anything. And uh, it just doesn't look happy. It doesn't look full. This would be what uh, an oyster uh, with dermo would look like, you know, it, in a time when an oyster that didn't have dermo would look much fuller. Uh, the point being that in the peconics, there's a good chance that all of our oysters have some level of dermo. We have gotten dermo from transmission and movement of oysters and dermo is around. The good part is that we manage around dermo, but here's the problem with dermo. And I know that almost every SPAT member has had oysters succumb to dermo because you, you have your oysters, now you're going on, let's say your third year and they're getting really nice and big and you start to get harvest your oysters and you notice that you had a hundred oysters in your bag on, in, in April and in May, 10 of them are dead. And you're like, how did these oysters die? Very possibly from dermo, uh, because that's how, it, that's how it looks. You don't lose all of your oysters. You look at, and all your oysters are dead. You lose like 10% a month until, so what you need to do is eat, you know, don't keep your oysters, just keep eating oysters, grow them as best you can, eat them, get a new batch, eat them. If you're hoarding oysters and you're losing 10%, that could be derma. And, and we, you know, we have sent samples out. We had one fellow who was having this problem on Shelter Island. We sent it out to the pathologist to look at. And she said that she had never seen such a high level of derma in any sample that she'd ever sampled, which is very interesting because what that's saying is with a, with a disease, you have kind of two issues. You have prevalence, which is the amount of it, and virulence, the, the power for it to kill. So we can have high prevalence and low virulence. In the Chesapeake, they have high prevalence and high virulence. What do they get? A lot of mortality. We have potential for high prevalence but low virulence. And one of the reasons why is we have, we generally have coldish winters and all oyster diseases don't like cold winters. So warm winters, you're going to see more mortality to something like dermo in, in the spring and the summer. Uh, so a warm winter can follow with potentially higher mortality of bigger oysters because of derma. So we can manage around it. And it is a pro protist. Uh, it was mistaken for a fungus. So there's that battle going on. Is it a fungus? Is it, is it a, a, a protist? And they got the uh, micrograph and they keyed it out. Now, this one is the one that Austin Farley was battling out to prove that it was a pro protist. Uh, Rosia varus used to be called juvenile oyster disease. When I started at Cornell in 1995, juvenile oyster disease was, was raging. So at that point in the hatcheries, and, and I was at grad school in Rhode Island. And so I, was, I went to school at the same school that Dr. Skid Row went to, and he started Moonstone Oyster Company. And, in 1993, I remember him saying to me, I've been growing oysters for 10 years. I've got my PhD in this stuff. 
I thought I knew everything about oysters and nobody can tell me why 90% of my seed just died. And at that same time, Dave Relier at Frank M. Flower and Sons lost 90% of his oysters and it was a new disease. And it really came up in like 93, 1993. And what was it? Well, you had these pathologists all trying to figure out what it was. It was something that was killing the oysters before they reached the size of a dime or a nickel. And you would see a couple uh, things about them, uh, this black, what's called conchylin. You would see shell checking. Basically, you would see 90% of your oysters dead. And what happened was Dave Relier, who was, by the way, back in the, back in the 90s and even before that in the 80s, Dave Relier over at, at, uh, at uh, Frank M. Flower and Sons was growing a lot of oysters and a lot of oyster seed. He was pretty much supplying all the oyster seed for any commercial oyster farm. And so when he lost his seed supply, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the growers lost their supply. And so what Dave did was he took some of the survivors from that cohort that didn't die, the 10% that lived, and as they were growing, he used those for brood stock for spawning. And the next season with that stock was very smart of him to do. I mean, that's kind of what you do. They've been doing that with MSX and Dermo and it just doesn't, doesn't make that much difference, apparently. It's a pro, protist. That's a little key there of what's about to happen. So they take the survivors of that and breed them. And the next year, instead of 90% of them dying, 50% of them died. And so they took survivors of that cohort, spawned them. Now 25% died. The next year, the survivors of that cohort, and now you didn't get any to die. So they literally bred the disease out of the system. Now, right there, when the battle was raging between Austin Farley and I can't remember her name, who was sure that it was a bacteria, Austin should have thrown in the, the, the white, raised the white flag and said, okay, I surrender, it must be a bacteria because it was bred out of the system. And no doubt what was happening is the oysters were building up a, 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 an antibody, a, an immunity to this thing. And uh, that's what happened. And so uh, there it was recognized in the mid eighties and um, very high mortality and all that stuff I just told you. But what's also interesting is when Dave Relier was, was using the survivors, the, some of the survivors, or maybe a lot of them, had this color morph, <coughs> black line that runs up the center. And so that didn't really, I don't believe, have anything to do with the disease. It was a color morph that carried along. And so once you started breeding these oysters, you were getting the genetics of the color morph plus the genetics of the disease resistance. So in, at least in the Peconic, when you see shell that has this oysters that have this black line on them, you can pretty much assume that they were from that flower disease resistant to Rosia varus or juvenile oyster disease oyster. And we had these for ages. I guess we still, I don't know. I, I haven't, looked as closely at our newer batches because Rosie of uh, this oyster, the other interesting thing about it, when I came to back to the Peconic Bays in 1995 and we're, I was going around all the creeks and whatnot looking for oysters, you'd never see any oysters. A couple of years later, I would see oyster set on ribbed mussels. And I'll never forget, I think I was in Mud Creek in Cutchog coming across a bed of ribbed mussels with oysters on them. And the oysters had a black line, the wild set had a black line. So the disease resistant stock uh, transferred into uh, wild recruitment. So, you know, they're no longer susceptible to this uh, bacteria that could kill them. Okay, a little bit about harmful algal blooms. That's what HABs are, harmful algal blooms. 
And so, you know, we, we, we get red tides and red tides. The, the thing that you have to know about red tides is if you read in the paper that there's a shellfish closure because of a, 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 a harmful red tide or a neurotoxic red, uh, tide, that's caused by a species of algae that's, that, that is, you know, native to here, but it's got a neurotoxin in it. And when it blooms up, which is a natural occurrence, it happens certainly every year in Cape Cod, there's a big bed of, 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 of Alexandrium, they call them cysts. They're like little, kind of like an egg, a spore or an egg in the, in the mud. And when that comes alive, it, it blooms up red tides. And when you get a red tide bloom, the shellfish can eat it fine. And what they're doing is they're bioaccumulating it in their gut. And if you eat an oyster that's been eating uh, the harmful red tide, you can get a dose, a higher level dose of this neurotoxin and get sick. So it does happen. There's very good tracking of it. There's a lot of testing and that you can actually see red tide from the, from the air. So they're, they're sampling and they're, they're spotting it. And they, there was a closure in mm -hmm. Kutchog about four years ago. And it's usually for like two or three weeks where you, you can't, you know, it's red tide and don't eat the shellfish. So be aware of that. If there's a red tide closure, you don't eat, you don't eat the, the, the shellfish. Uh, it doesn't hurt the shellfish. You can get hurt by it, certain species of it. The brown tide was a different one that came in in, in in the 90s and that one was just affecting oysters. You could, the oysters, the adult oysters might be able to eat it or clams or whatnot and you could eat that shellfish and you wouldn't get sick. But brown tide really caused a problem for shellfish larvae, I believe. And because of that, it pretty much wiped out scallops. In, in the 90s, that's what, or in the 80s rather. And that's what, uh, oh, my computer's not plugged in. Hold on, I'm, gonna, I'm about to lose you to a low battery. Uh, I didn't even notice that. Okay, there we go. Uh, so, you know, that that brown tide, Ariacoccus andrea for Jefferins, for your information, is really what, what yeah kind of brought scallops to their knees. What's bringing scallops to their knees now? They're still working on that. It's not even part of this show here because they haven't determined if it's warm temperatures, stressing them out, uh, po possible, there is a, a possibility of a, a, of a fungus. Uh, there's some new predators. So that one hasn't been determined yet, but it's kind of like a amalgamation uh, or a uh, conglomeration or something Asian of all these things we're talking about happening to scallops right now, but not the, and there is actually a, 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 it was just in the paper about brown tide in the Great South Bay. So brown tide hasn't completely gone away. It just really hit the Peconics hard in, uh, in the eighties and uh, into the nineties when I was, Starting at Cornell, I, it was still here in 95. So uh, Prorocentrum is another algal species that wreaks havoc with shellfish. Uh, that one I haven't heard too much about uh, in the last couple of years, but a lot of these things don't just kind of go away. They go in cycles. So we'll, the word's out for that. And there's plenty of other ones that, that are around. Some of them in Florida, like Ciguatera, that's... Uh, that's in a lot of the coral reefs. Alexandrum, we have um, uh, Pseudonitsia, we have. Uh, so Pyridinium, we have, I believe. So these are things that we're watching. And all these, and you can see responsible for paralytic shellfish poisoning, diuretic shellfish poisoning, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. They all sound awful. And they kind of, they, they are, but, uh, people haven't really been getting uh, sick from them because we're aware of their presence and know how to track them. There is, a, there is a, uh, another algal species that we call now a mahogany tide. It is a red algae, uh, cochlidinium, 
and you see it almost traveling like an oil slick. And we've been getting these mahogany tides that travel in the Peconic Bays. And, and, and it's really, you know, it, it's weird algae because it, it makes the water kind of have this reddish glow to it. And it almost looks like it's got a border, almost like an oil slick. And if you're a sailor and you're out sailing, sometimes you think it's a cloud cover and there, there's not a cloud in the sky. That's brown, uh, that's the, the mahogany tide. And that doesn't cause, a, a shellfish can eat it. They don't like it. It's a, they, it, they don't thrive on it, but it won't make you sick if you eat that shellfish. So there are no shellfish closures for, for mahogany tides. Okay, now this is important. And this is, th this is coming up more as our water temperatures are rising, we're getting some issues with bacterias. And, it's, and we're gonna talk about a couple of Vibrios and you can hear about these Vibrios. And sometimes you read in the paper, the, the way that newspaper people like to put it is like this, flesh eating bacteria in your waters. Jeez, that sounds like, you know, the, the zombie apocalypse has just entered the bay. And the truth of the matter is that it's bad stuff. Uh, down in, in, in the Louisiana, where it hardly ever gets cold in the water, uh, in, in the early spring and into the summer, you get these proliferation of a couple of Vibrios, Vibrio vulnificus and Vibrio parahemolyticus. And these two, actually cause mortality in humans every year. And I've been, you know, I've been teaching this stuff for a while and every year I'm talking about the, you know, 24 good old boys that died in Louisiana from eating oysters. And it's kind of amazing because you would think that the, the, the food and drug or the, you know, FDA or the, the, the uh, so, some food organization would crack down on that you could actually die from eating anything. Uh, and the simple fact is they sell a lot of oysters in Louisiana and people that are immune uh, deficient can, can die from this Vibrio that's, that's in the water. And this, these Vibrios have come up to New York there, we were tracking them there a couple of years ago, there was some uh, outbreaks. Nobody got, nobody died. Uh, <laughs> that was another thing that happened. I, I'm going to say now time is marching on. It might, might've been like eight years. Ago. There was a, uh, there was a, two people got sick from eating oysters. Eating oysters. Oop, hold on. Somebody's, do I have to mute everybody? I, uh, there was a there, two people got sick from eating oysters and they tracked them to oysters from Oyster Bay uh, and you know restaurant they have to have the diggers tag for 21 days so they say the people go into the hospital they're feeling ill they got intestinal issues where what did you eat well I ate oysters where'd you eat them well I ate them at this restaurant they go to the restaurant they look at the diggers tag for the date, they're from Oyster Bay. And they shut everything down that summer. And, and apparently at some meeting, one of the baymen like stood up on the table and said, you mean to tell me that nobody died and you're shutting us down? <laughs> it's kind of funny in a way, but it's not that funny. And they never found it again and nobody ever got sick again. They tested the shellfish, they tested the water, they never saw it again. But that's how, if you have one case in the hospital of somebody that ate oysters, then nobody cares. And that one person just goes on his way to the, to the bathroom. If two people come in, now it's a epizootic. Oh, it's kind of interesting. And now in the face of COVID, everyone's gonna be like, whoa, we don't want you know, any, anything like that going on. So, uh, you know, but this is something that we have to pay attention to because our waters are getting warmer and these Vibrios can 
start growing and, 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 and multiplying to a greater extent than they have been in the past, like they do in warmer climates like Louisiana. So we have to pay attention to that. Because of the, this occurrence that happened a couple of years ago, the growers have been uh, mandated different handling regimes because a lot of times it's about how you handle your shellfish. For instance, if you harvest your shellfish and you leave it in the baking sun and it gets warm, the if there's Vibrio in that oyster, it'll double at a very fast rate. So if you ice them down and keep them cool, then they won't double and it won't be as harmful. So now there's different handling. The, the, bay, the bay people in the Peconic Bay can no longer just take their oysters out of the water and, and, and put them on the, on the boat and work for a couple hours and then bring them into shore. They have to keep them cool from the minute they pull them out of the water. So that's something that we learned and, it, and people haven't been getting sick of Vibrio. So, you know, we, we, we might be able to handle this just fine. If the occurrence of these Vibrios come up, it, it, it becomes very well documented and you hear about it. So it's not like, oh, I wonder if my stuff has Vibrios in it. You will know, uh, you will know. Okay. Because shellfish, uh, are filter feeders. And so whatever's in the water, shellfish are, are taking in one way or the other. They're either using it, processing it, incorporating it into chit tissue or shell, spitting it out, whatever they're doing. Uh, whatever's in the water, an oyster and other filter feeders really it becomes part of them. So the best thing you can do is eat shellfish from great water and we have great water. You know, these are just things we have to pay attention to. Everything we're talking about with water chemistry, we have to pay attention to it because it can affect your oyster. Right now, uh, you know, for spat members, no spat member can grow in uncertified waters. All the waters have been tested to a certain degree. Um, and because of that, nobody gets sick eating oysters, which is great. But we have to pay attention because things can change in, in changing climates and, and changing issues that come up. So we want to pay attention to that. That's cool. Oysters are very good. My son just oh. called me. He's like, can we make a, 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 a little, can we capsulize a oyster, all the nutrition in a little, in a little thing you can take? And uh, just eat oysters, you know, don't take it in a little capsule, just eat the oysters. They're, they're very high in zinc. Uh, they're high in, in other things, sources of vitamins and thiamine and riboflavin and all these things. But really, you know, the zinc and, and, and level is higher than just about anything out there. So uh, there is some cholesterol. There is cholesterol, but what I heard my neighbor, he was like, no, my doctor says I can't eat cholesterol. Well, there's less cholesterol in an oyster than there is in chicken. So, you know, if you're eating chicken because of your cholesterol level, then don't worry about oysters. Uh, very high in zinc, manganese, phosphorus, and these things. So it's good. Hey, if it was good for, uh, what was his name? Casanova? No, the other guy. <laughs> Who was the guy? Um, come on, who was it that ate all the oysters? My mind is slipping. Oh, there's some pictures of what you should be doing with your oysters, courtesy of James Wojcik. So you can make, you can have an onion ring and a, and a, and a little sardine thing or, or squid and calamari on your oysters, or you can have passion fruit and you can have caviar. You can have uh, sprigs of, you can have a, here's a Reuben. I love that. No, that's a breakfast oyster. That's not the Reuben. That's a breakfast oyster or a mushroom and thing oyster. Here's a dessert oyster and a fruit oyster. There's, there's a prosciutto oyster. And look at this beautiful, here's the Reuben. Here's a Reuben oyster. Here's a shish kebab oyster. Go out and have fun with your oysters. Here's a charred tuna salmon oyster. All these beautiful things that you can make with your oysters if you want to. That's James. Uh, 
the photographer of these beautiful oysters. So I'm going to stop sharing. There's everybody. Are there any questions about any of this stuff we've talked about? There's my house in the background. I bought a new house. Look at my house. I'm working on oh, it. I like it. Very good. Isn't that nice? I, I just am getting rid of all the old furniture. Anyone want a couch? There's a couch. You could, I threw out a whole bunch of furniture. So we haven't even moved the furniture in yet. We're painting like mad, but that's my new house. We'll have everybody over for a barbecue. It's coming. I, we only had one meal in the kitchen so far, so it's, it, it's coming slowly, but I got a guy coming to remove the bamboo on Tuesday, so. Any questions on any of this stuff? You can you can ask away if you want, or you can just ask at any time. You've got my email. Uh, we're, we 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 try to answer questions for everybody. Um, we try to stay on top of everything. This is a year-round clearinghouse of anything marine or oyster, so you're you're more than welcome to reach out at any time, and we try to get back to everybody. At, uh, kind of so if you have questions now's a good time to ask them if not uh oh it's late oh my goodness i kept everyone on for such a long time did everyone get some information out there for your next cocktail party no hey kim i had a question yeah uh what i put on it on the screen for everybody uh, my brother-in-law just uh, called us today they had a brown tide in saint petersburg florida I'll be. First time in history in that part of Tampa Bay. Well, you know, you bring up something very interesting because when brown tide came up in the Peconic Bay, it was like, well, where did that come from? It's a new algae where, I mean, it was just invented. And so here you got St. Pete. And, and if it's, if it is the same brown tide, Oreococcus and Drew for what they, what they want to do is network with Peconics to try to find some similarities that might have happened. Because, you know, I don't know if they ever really totally nailed down the, the reason why brown tide came up. I will give you a, an interesting scenario. A lot of people said, well, it's because of runoff and pollution and this and that. It could be the opposite. It could be that brown tide if you recall, when brown tide came up, it's when the duck farms all closed. <laughs> so it could be that the duck farms were adding nutrient that were keeping brown tide away, and that when there was less nutrient, brown tide could capitalize on a lower nutrient regime, which is an interesting thing to look at. So, you know, there are some little keys that tell you that if you have a drought, you would tend to have brown tide. If you had a lot of rain and a lot of runoff, you didn't have brown tide. So it's, it's like the opposite of a nutrient loading. So St. Pete wants to look at the potential for low nutrient regime. And another thing that people were saying was chelated iron. So there's a couple clues to look at for the scientists that are looking at that. But you bring up an interesting point. Where did this stuff come from? I, wh wh why has it never been documented before? And why is it happening now? So, I, and that's, thanks for bringing that up because I had not heard that so well. Have we seen anything in Peconic Bay at all? We haven't, you know, there, there was just in the paper a day or two ago about brown tide really raging in the Great South Bay. So in Peconic Bay, I haven't heard any indications of it. We would not like to see it come up again. Uh, and it's not like we did anything to fix it either by the way. It was, it was a cycle of, of it coming in. I, once you get something like that, it, you kind of, nothing you can really do. Nature is doing this for you, but uh, we'll keep you posted. I have not heard anything uh, of, of any sort of dimensions in the Baconic, but there was definitely press in Great South Bay. So, One last question on yeah. the algae studies that were being done. I think that was last year, the year before, you know, in those big tubes. Yeah. The different th any any research coming out of that? Oh, in in our facility? Correct. Well, we're we're not. We're, what we're after is culturing the best aquaculture grade algae. We're not really looking at like 
culture. We have in the past, we cultured, we had a grant where we were culturing brown tide to study it, to see if clams were able to eat it and keep it from blooming. But uh, we're pretty much not doing the research on uh, alternate species. We're, we're looking mostly on how to grow the, the agricultural grade ones as best we can. Okay, so. thank you. Hey, Tom. You, you abandoned me, you left. I didn't leave, we got stuck in California and now we're back. Oh, good, okay, welcome back. Thank you. Good, any other questions for anyone? We have to make yeah. an appointment if we're gonna come down as, and volunteer at the facility or do we just show up? Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, eight to noon, come on by. All right, my son and I will be there Monday morning. Good, good, good. All right, see you then. Good, excellent. I got a question, Tim. Yeah. Is there an oyster that tastes like a pizza? Uh, if, you, <laughs> if you put now, look, that's Augie. I can. I don't see you, but I can hear your voice. I can hear your voice. Now, if you if you were to take an oyster and put pepperoni on it, I bet you you could get it to taste like a pizza. And if you put, All right. if you take an oyster and you put a jelly donut on it. Uh, I would not be surprised that Augie would do that too, because he's the donut king. So. All right, buddy. Thank you. Good. Okay. Anybody with a real question? <laughs> yeah, Kim. You said with the water temperature being what it is, would you say that our mature oysters have already spawned this yes, year? I would. If you, if you, you know, we we kind of talked about this in another lecture about. The months with R and the months with R. Right now, if you open up your oysters and they don't look as full as they did in in April or uh, uh, October or December, it's because they spawned out and, and they would look kind of thin. It's called post breeding thinness. They, they if they've spawned out, they now need to recharge. So this is. A lot of times when they say, oh, you shouldn't eat oysters that in the months that don't have an R. Well, you can eat your oysters. Definitely, you can eat your oysters. They might not be as sweet and as full because they've spawned and they're going to recharge now till, you know, September. So uh, I would say now if you uh, 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 in another respect, depending on where you're growing, if you have cooler water, and you shuck your oyster and it looks chock-a-block white with that's the gonad full of spawn. It hasn't spawned out yet. So you will know when you shuck your oyster and eat it. Yeah. But I would say that at this point, oysters have spawned. Yeah. All right, Kim, I have a quick question. Michael. Yeah. Is there any, how do you prevent the infestation of all these predators onto cages? Uh, you keep your, you, you, you know, you keep up with it. If, if you're, if you're taking your oysters out of the water and you're fooling around with them or pressure washing them or scrubbing them or cleaning them every two weeks, you're not going to have an infestation. A lot of these things I showed you were you know, extremes like abandoned equipment that hasn't been tended in eight months or, or a year or something. Uh, certain fowlers come up a lot faster. Like you might say, well, I just did mine two weeks ago and I just pulled it up and there's little things all over it. Yes, that's, that's new. That's the new fouling coming out there, but it's never that bad after two weeks that you can't handle it with a little this and that. Uh, and you don't wanna be so crazy. So some of the new members that come in, how often do I have to tend my oysters? And I say every six hours and they look at me like, oh no, yes, I'm joking. No, of course you don't have to tend them every six hours. Uh, but I would say that if you tend them every month, it'll be harder than if you tend them every two weeks. Well, let me ask you, how does, how does somebody in the commercial business deal with this issue? If they have thousands of cages out there they, and they're getting hit with all this. They, they literally have to have a routine where they're cycling through their gear. I mean, if you think that being an oyster grower is easy work commercially, it isn't because you just bring up a point. 
uh, I've known people that what they would do is bring up cage bodies with say 24 of the ba oyster bags in them, cage bodies, big cage bodies, bring them up on their barge, take like three of these things. So now they have like a hundred oyster bags in them and drive home with them on the boat and leave them out overnight. And so the air drying would kill all the fouling and stuff and then go back and put them back in the water in the morning. So right. there's, you gotta, you believe me, that's what these guys have to do. And if you don't, and I've seen commercial oyster growers that pick up a cage that they've left and it's a disaster and you can get a lot of mortality. And if it was in muddy bottom, you can get a lot of, uh, of mortality to the mud. So yeah, you, that's, the, that's the, the hard part of being an oyster grower is keeping up with your gear. And so you can see some fascinating innovations of how to deal with gear. If you ever see the video of mook shellfish and their oyster grow cages, it's like a conveyor belt in a special boat that just flips them. Uh, it's, it's a great video. I'll, I'll try to get uh, a link sent out. Mook, mook how do you, mook, how do you spell it? Okay, mook of Maine. And mook of Maine. An oyster growing apparatus. It, that's an innovation of how to deal with literally thousands of cages autumn in an automated fashion so what you would want to do if you were a commercial oyster grower is really think of how you are going to automate certain things and it's expensive sometimes it, it, it's not a cheap venture if you're going to have a knuckle boom crane that pulls up big cages and these kind of things so. right good all right good good excellent well it's friday live it up and come and see us. We're, we're there every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm at Tiana every Tuesday. And uh, there's Darcy. Everyone misses Darcy. And we're going to stop recording and we're going to go home. 